like a memory question. It's uh, like you'll go person, woman, man, camera, TV. So they say, could you repeat that? So I said, yeah. So it's person, woman, man, camera, TV. Okay, that's very good. If you get it in order, you get extra points. If you, okay, now he's asking you other questions, other questions, and then 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes later, they say, remember the first question? Not the first, but the 10th question? Give us that again. Can you do that again? And you go, person, woman, man, camera, TV. If you get it in order, you get extra points. He said, nobody gets it in order. It's actually not that easy, but for me, it was easy. And that's not an easy question. In other words, they ask it to you, they give you five names and you have to repeat them. And that's okay. If you repeat them out of order, it's okay, but, but you know, it's not as good. But then when you go back about 20, 25 minutes later and they say, go back to that question. They don't tell you this. Go back to that question and repeat them. Can you do it? And you go, person, woman, man, camera, TV. They say, that's amazing. How did you do that? I do it because I have like a good memory because I'm cognitively there. Now, Joe should take that test because something's going on. And, and I say this with respect. I mean, it's going to probably happen to all of us, right? You know, it's going to happen. Look, tomorrow's Superstar Tuesday, and I want to thank you all. I tell you what, I'm rushing ahead, aren't I? 150 million people have been killed since 2007 when Bernie voted to exempt the gun manufacturers from liability. It would put 720 million, back, million women back in the workforce. My name's Joe Biden. I'm a Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. What's not to like about Vermont in terms of the beauty of it? And what a neat town. Play the radio. Make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. We choose science over fiction. We choose truth over facts. Think about it. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the goal. You know the, you know the thing. The things I'm proudest of. It's getting passed, getting moved, get, getting control of the Paris Climate Accord. I'm the guy that came back after meeting with Deng Xiaoping and making the case that I believe China would join if we put pressure on them. You had people like Margaret Thatcher, oh, excuse me, you had people like the, the former chairman and leader of the party in, the, in Germany. Go to Joe 3033. No hesitation, one of the great memories of all time. Hi class, today we'll be talking about memory. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite subjects because it, uh, it brings back old memories and we don't often go back and think about them, but when you do, and especially if you learn some of the uh, intricacies of memory research in psychological literature, what you'll find is you begin to question what you think of as your memory. My dad told me a story Actually, this happened to us. I don't remember the phone call, but I, I remember going. <clears throat> we went on um, a family vacation, and we went all the way out to Colorado, which was really far. I had never been that far away on a vacation, and it was really intense and awesome. It's in the Mesa Verde, cab uh, the, the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde in the southwestern part of Colorado, and I was a young man at the time, maybe eight very young man and we had a wonderful time climbing all around these cliff dwellings the natives uh, Americans had carved out whole cities in the side of cliffs and we got to climb these big wooden log ladders and we got to go around and see their dwelling places and their gathering places in the side of cliffs it's really amazing I highly recommend any of you going out to Mesa Verde which is the um, cliff, cliff dwelling place in southwest Colorado. So we went out, we did that, and <clears throat> we got back to the hotel that night and my dad called up his parents and he said, Mom and Dad, 
I'm so thankful for you guys taking me to see this because now I've gotten to take my boys to see it and we had a wonderful time. Thank you for taking me when I was a boy to the Mesa Verde Cliff Dwellings. And his parents said, you never went there, but you had a book about it. And our family before you were born went there. We drove in a car all the way out to Colorado from San Diego. We were there, we have family pictures of it. You weren't born yet. You've never been there. You see, memory's tricky. I love that story because I've just told you a story that my dad had taken me to Mesa Verde when I was a boy. And yet, I'm telling you the, the, the crux of the story is, is that that didn't happen. Although he believed it so much, he planned a trip for us to go all the way out to Colorado. Now, I'm glad that his memory was bad and that we got to go take that trip. But he behaved as if he believed that. When you think of a memory, a false memory like that, it really affected him enough to take up his two boys and his wife and head off to Colorado on, on a faulty belief, on a memory that wasn't real. That's not an uncommon happen. That's not something that is uncommon for people to have happen to them when they realize that something that they remembered one way isn't exactly so. Why is it? Why are memories not a strict recording? Like I'm recording this on a video. Why isn't it just a recording? Why isn't my brain recording every little thing that I'm experiencing from my sensory neurons? Why isn't my brain storing all of that? And why don't I have access to remembering everything that I studied all those years back? That is the mystery of memory. And that's what we're gonna explore. So memory. The book talks about three things that the memory system of humans is capable of doing. One of them is encoding, the other one is storage, and the third one is retrieval. If there's a problem with any of these three systems, then people might think that they have a memory problem or they might have a memory problem. But they could be vastly different issues for those particular people. When we say encoding, what we really mean is a, the memory system's learning ability. Encoding means that you're taking something that experienced that was experienced by you or a thought that you had and you're turning it into a language that your brain can store. Storage is something that your brain does through neural networking, through bringing together disparate ideas. And retrieval is when you want to bring back information that you've previously learned. Yes? I have a tick in the back of my head. All right. My son has a tick in the back of his head. Let's see. All right. And there's a tick there. Look at that. You must see it. There was. There was a tick there. Here, let's see if we can. Ow. Can't I zoom in on that. For a while. Nah. It's not big. Look. Tiny little. Tiny little tick. All right, bye-bye, Mr. Tick. All right, I'm back. That's what you get when you work from home. But I was talking about encoding. Encoding is learning. Storage is how we keep things in our memory, how we create systems to remember things. And retrieval is how we bring back memories that we've, that we've learned. Uh, and so these are the three parts of memory that we're gonna cover today. Some of the first people to talk about the memory system in this compartmentalized way was two researchers, Schachter, I'm sorry, it was Atkinson and Schifrin. Atkinson uh, actually signed my diploma from UC Irvine. Uh, he became later the president of the UC Regents, and so that's kind of cool. But he was a memory researcher, and he, along with Atkinson and Schifrin, they proposed a model of memory that had different modes for memory. One would be sensory memory. Again, sensory memory is just anything that happens to your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your body kinesthetic, um, your tongue, all the five senses. That's sensory memory. It's very short, right? And you get lots of, you're bombarded with input all the time. Most of that, we don't do anything with. So I don't remember what my knee felt like five seconds ago because I wasn't paying attention to it. 
So attention is something that allows for these sensory memories to come into short-term memory. So for a little bit, we have short-term memory and short-term memory gives us a little bit of time to think about something, to manipulate it, to, to get it ready to be stored into long-term memory. If we elaborate on something that happens in our short-term memory, then we can make it stick there longer, better. For example, do you remember what I said my son's name was who had a tick in his head? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you only said it once. Okay, we can rewind the tape and look. But if you had done something with that, right? It was sensory memory. I said the guy's name, my son's name, and he had something going on. What he had going on was a tick. See, ticks people tend to think of as a little bit dangerous. You don't tend to think of a little kid's name as something that's terribly important, but a tick, oh, there's ticks around here. I should be careful, right? Because ticks carry Lyme disease. So your brain, associating all those things, pulls in information about ticks and goes, that's dangerous, and then starts concentrating on the tick rather than his name. But if the quiz was about his name right now, you'd be stumped because you go, I don't, I don't remember. Maybe you do remember. Maybe you remember because you have someone who has that same name and they're your friend. Or perhaps it shocked you that my son's name was that. I don't know. Whatever, for whatever reason, you may have elaborated on that particular experience. And when you elaborate on something, that means that you think of more things that relate to it or are associated with it. Remember in the learning videos, we talked about association. And if you've done that, if you've thought about something in an elaborative way, that storage that's happening is going into long-term memory, and that's the last of these modal models of memory in Atkinson and Schifrin's model. It enables you to retrieve it more easily because it's, it's connected to many different things. And so that's the stages of memory that Atkinson and Schifrin promoted. Now, there's some problems with it. Uh, one of the problems is it doesn't necessarily account for what we do in short-term memory. So short-term memory, also a lot of people think, oh, I have problems with short-term memory because I forgot where my car, where I parked my car in the car parking lot of the college. That's not a short-term memory problem. That's a retrieval problem. You have difficulty retrieving from long-term memory where your car was parked. And that's probably because, again, just like with the tick, you were distracted by other things that you thought were more important. When we concentrate on something and when we put a lot of attention onto it, uh, we can store and retrieve information readily from our memory. A man by the name of Alan Baddeley came along after Atkinson and Schifrin and he began to work on sort of the, the system that is that sort of playing around with that information mode. What we called short-term memory, what Alan uh, what Atkinson and Schiffrin call it, Alan Baddeley termed it working memory. Now working memory is a cool thing because it really says, look, this is where you can work on memory. This is where you can adjust it, uh, relate things to it, associate things to it, and then help hopefully store it ad adequately so that you can retrieve it later on. And that that working memory had three different components. And the three components that he talked about, I think the book says four, uh, the three I'm going to talk about are the central executor. The central executor, for lack of a better term, is what directs your attention, right? So now I'm focusing on teaching, right? But if I was going to shift my attention to maybe I feel a tick on my leg or something, um, that is how I'm going to do it. Is that In my short-term memory, I'm going to be uh, going on lecture, 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 but then I can switch over. And the central executor is what allows us in our working memory to shift from one aspect to the next. Another part of Alan Baddeley's working memory, again, he replaced short-term memory and he just called it working memory. It's like labeling it a new name. Like Billabong USA became Hurley. If you didn't know about that, go, go read up on that. Working memory has two elements to it that are separate from the central executor, but they both kind of do the same thing. And what that is, that it's almost like your sensory DVR. It's almost like you can go back and replay something. If I were to say, flash up a symbol here on the screen, you know, maybe, maybe like right there. I'll see if I can do that later in, 
post edit. Uh, if I were to flash up a symbol and your brain didn't have enough time to memorize every part of it, what it would do is it would sort of attempt to reconstruct it in your mind if you saw it up here. And you probably wouldn't get all the details of it, but you could be pretty good at that if I said, okay, now I want you to draw that thing that was up here. You might look down at it and start drawing and think, I got, I got most of that. That's called your visual spatial sketch pad. What that means is, is your brain holds memory for visual things uh, as though they're a construct, as though it's like, if you think of uh, RAM on a computer, that's one of the analogies that's been used for this, is the random access memory. How much processing can you do is limited in working memory, right? You can't have, I can't show you a map of Venice, Italy, and have you memorize every single canal and street in a short period of time, but there are people that know that. It takes them long periods of time, lots of attention, lots of study, lots of practice for it. But if I just flash it up to you, you'd have a gist of it. You would get a, a general sense of what it looked like if, if I had a map of Venice, Italy right there. I, I don't, unless I, again, in post-edit, go in and fill it in if, if I'm nice to you. Um, but you can imagine. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, 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 they didn't. But you can imagine what it'd be like if they did, right? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Everybody on? Good. Great. Grand. Wonderful. No yelling on the bus. And finally, the last one is something that's, it's, it's a neat name. It's called your phonological loop. Phonological loop is something that is like the visual spatial sketch pad that Baddeley proposed our working memory does. But the phonological loop is your brain's ability, your cognitive ability, to listen to what someone's saying and without even knowing it, without knowing what it meant per se, auditorily from your sense of hearing, you would be able to repeat that thing. Auditorily from your sense of hearing, you would be able to repeat that thing. Auditorily, from your sense of hearing, you would be able to repeat that thing. You don't have to repeat this if you're watching this where there's a bunch of people. You don't have to say it out loud, but try and say it in your head, okay? I'll, I'll say something and then I'll stop. He swam across the lake. Hopefully, you just said, he swam across the lake. That one's easy. You get what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm saying something, and then when I pause, you're to say the same thing. And this is exploring our phonological loop, or your working memory's ability to hear something that's said to you, to store it for a short period of time, and then to utilize it to recreate it, okay? The winding road led to the village. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you can do those three, well then, sounds like you have an intact arcuate fasciculus. Don't worry about that. But what if I said something in another language? No hay niños desatendidos. ¿Dónde está mi perro? What if I said something in a language you had no familiarity with? Could you do that? If I say something in Spanish, perhaps you're confident that you could repeat it because, well, it has repeatability, you've heard it before. What that means is that you have had exposure to Spanish before and so your brain can retrieve back those information. But what if I said, che bili bili ba. Now would you be able to repeat that correctly? It depends. You probably haven't heard 
West African Fulani language before. It's probably not something that you've heard. Yet, you were able to repeat that, or at least attempt it pretty accurately in your mind. This ability of our phonological loop to do that enables us uh, it's so much power in learning. Kids will mimic people when they're young. They'll mimic them as they're learning language and they're using their ability of their phonological loop to do it. They don't know what it means when we say things, but they will repeat after us. And that helps them to sort of get the context with which we're using these symbolic representations of our world through speech. Don't worry, we'll get to language in a couple chapters. But they need that phonological loop. So Baddeley with the central executor, phonological loop and visual spatial sketch pad. All right, I think that's all I'm gonna tell you about that. I wanna to talk to you about forgetting. Um, we started this topic by telling you about a story about my dad that was a false memory. But what about memories that are real and you forget them? How many of you have had that experience before where you think you remembered something, you know, the, the, the combination to a lock that you normally use. You think you know it because you have confidence you've done it before, but what about forgetting? Let's say I gave you a, a lock and the locks combination was E, O, S, C. So it was a, it was a four letter combination. Now you, you turn the first one to E, the second one to O, the next one to S, and the next one to C. You open it up, it opens. You go and do whatever you need to do. Do you think you'll remember that later? Or do you think you'll forget it? Well, that depends. A man by the name of Ebbinghaus studied this by making up nonsense words. E-O-S-C, Yosk. It's a, it's a made up word, I just made it up right there. It's my camera is an E-O-S Canon. So E-O-S Canon, that's what I did. I just made that up by using those letters. But now see, I've given you an opportunity to elaborate in your short term memory on that. What if we just tried to memorize it without elaborating on the particular subject matter? If we didn't say, oh, that's related to the type of camera I have and it's the letters E-O-S and it's a Canon, so C. If I didn't give you that preordained structure, you know Canon is a manufacturer of photography equipment. What if you didn't know that? Then it wouldn't be helpful to you. That would be more information to learn. But the more you know, the easier it's gonna be to learn because you can relate Canon to the C at the last part of the combination for the lock. Again, you might not know it, but you might forget it. Ebbinghaus, did a really cool thing. He made up tons of nonsense words. Uh, Ebbinghaus is German, and so he made them up in German. But there's something you should know. You could make up words that follow the correct orthographic representation of the letter and don't violate any of the grammatical ways that we combine letters. If you put P-X-H-I, that doesn't mean anything. It violates some real fundamental rules that don't you wouldn't know how to say in English but if you said something like F L U N floon floon doesn't mean anything it's not a word F L U N but it doesn't violate any of our properties of English how, how to combine words so he made up a bunch of those tons and tons of these nonsense words they didn't mean anything in German but they followed the rules of German right so he was doing this and then he did some very interesting things. He used himself as the test, test subject, which is easy to criticize, but this was happening way back when. Um, so be careful when you criticize people that didn't know that that wasn't something to do. He didn't know he should get an, a research grant and an IRB committee should approve his human subjects and he should have tested a bunch of people with this, but also he was the one who was with himself for a long enough time to be tested. What he did was he memorized, he, he broke all those words up. He made them all up and he broke them up into lists. Let's say a list of 30 words. What he'd do is he'd sit there until he memorized all 30 words in a row. The moment he got all 30 words correct, after he like had memorized it, he put the list down, closed it, and then went over and said, okay, I'm gonna wait 
I don't know, the first time he said, maybe I'll wait a minute. So he occupied his mind by having to solve math or something. He wasn't thinking about that list of words. He was not actively elaborating on it like we normally do if we're trying to memorize something. He occupied his mind with other things. And then after a minute, bell rings, you know, he set an alarm on his on Siri or his or Alexa or something. And he went back and tried to memorize and tried to recreate that list. That list that he had put away after he memorized it 100% after about a minute, he lost a substantial amount of those words. Again, nonsense words. They weren't like dog, cat, ball, kayak, orange, wind sail. They weren't words that he knew. They were nonsense words. So it wasn't like he could particularly have some sort of relationship to them. I'm looking at a wind sail and a kayak and a ball. So those are easy for me to relate to and I would remember them easily because they're in my environment. I have a little person, woman, man, camera, TV. Elaborated on them already. These were not like that. These nonsense words he couldn't elaborate on, he couldn't erase. He couldn't, he couldn't attach them with an association of something he already knew because they were nonsense. Okay. After a minute, he forgot a bunch. Then, he recorded the percentage he got and plotted it on an X and a Y axis. Now the X, the x-axis that comes across the horizontal, that was time, right? So at the, at near the zero, one minute is just a little bit. And then at the zero for the y going up is zero correct, and percentage correct, and then all the way at the top would be 100% correct. So all the time he started with 100% correct at time one, but at time two he plotted how much of that list that he remembered based on the time that had passed. So after he did the one minute one, he said, okay, I'll memorize another 30 nonsense words. And he did, and when he got 100%, he put that list away, put it away in his book, so it's away from him. He did something else for five minutes. He went and washed the dishes, or he swept the yard, or he played with his dog, or he uh, fed the birds, but he didn't remember, he wasn't actively trying to remember that list of words. After five minutes, Siri says, your, your time is up, Ebbinghaus, it's time to go remember your words and he went back and he tried to remember as many of those words as he could as he goes back and remembers after five minutes there was a substantial loss of memory so he forgot from from zero to five minutes he forgot a lot of the list more than he forgot after one minute a substantial amount more and then he would do another version of that memorize a list of 30 words and then wait 10 minutes memorize a list of words and wait 30 minutes memorize a list of words and wait an hour memorize a list of words and wait 24 hours. And what's amazing is he found that forgetting happens rapidly. So there's a real loss of memories very quickly. It, it, it's precipitous fall. But then, after 30 minutes to an hour, there's almost no difference in the amount of lost information from that list. Then he went like, well, what about what about a week? And he tests himself after, what about a month? And he tests himself after a month. You see, what he had an hour after memorizing that list, there was almost no change between the hour after he memorized that list and like a year later. If you've got it, you've got it. You lose a substantial amount immediately, but that amount that you retain, the amount that you don't forget, you keep not forgetting that for a very, very long time. So, what will you remember about this lecture? I'm guessing, based on Ebbinghaus's research, you're going to forget most of it. Now, what do you do about that, right? If you know you're going to forget most of this lecture, well, thankfully, in, in the digital age, you can just rewatch the lecture. You could go read the book. But really importantly, recognize that he was memorizing nonsense words. He didn't have any of his normal brain's ability to relate it to things that he himself connected with. That he himself already knew. To build upon what he already knew. Alright, I'm going to tell you three things. One. The Golden Gate Bridge, it gets painted year-round. 
year round. So they start at one end, paint, and it takes them a long time. By the time they get to the next, to the other side, to keep it that enigmatic burnt orange look. I think that's the, or it's international orange or something like that. I think international orange. It's not golden, that's for sure. But they paint it year round. By the time they get to this end, to keep it that same color, because all that fog in San Francisco, all the sort of salty air, it deteriorates the paint. They gotta go back to the other side and repaint it again. So they stay painting all year long. Okay. The next one, the island in the South Pacific is actually tilted up because of volcanic activity. So it, it tilted it, but the trees that come out the top, they grew and then they got tilted. So they come out at an angle. And finally, the wind on the North Pole rotates counterclockwise. So if you look at the globe up at the top, it's rotating counterclockwise. That's how wind goes. If you wanted to know about weather, you could just look at that. The wind goes that way and then follow it down around the globe and you'll see patterns of wind. You'll see hurricanes forming. You'll see Saharan dust storms coming for us. Uh, that's the thing that was in the news recently. I don't know where it is now. Okay, who knows, maybe fake news.